Ustaz, uh, Ustaz Muhammad Muhammad is going to talk to us a little bit about the addiction to music, inshallah. So we'll get that underway. Yeah, So just at my seat. Okay. The mic is ready. Um, just a quick disclaimer as people are trickling in. I don't want anyone to miss this, inshallah. Um, when you're sitting in a conference, there's a, like from one to eight, there's a lot of information coming at you, right? On a lot of different topics. So the best thing to do would probably to try to focus on one or two things in each topic that kind of resonate with you and carry that with you after the conference. Don't try to remember everything. Just remember like one or two things that, oh, wow, that was a cool point. And sit after the speaker is done and try to reflect on it so that you don't forget about it after you leave. Um, as for addiction, addiction to music, um, addictions in general. Um, just sitting in the conference is not going to take away your addiction if you have any of these addictions, right? Uh, the same way you put time and effort into building that habit, which turned into an addiction, uh, it's going to take time and effort to reverse it, right? They don't have any data for music because music isn't considered a bad thing, but for smokers, like people who smoke tobacco, it takes, on average, the smoker who quits, it takes him about seven quit attempts before they finally quit. So I can only imagine what that, would, what that number would be for music, who, where we live in a society where music is fine, like you're, you're extreme if you think that music is, is bad, right? So don't feel overwhelmed by all this information, inshallah, like I said, pick one or two points from each each topic, reflect on it so that you'll remember it. If you're a parent with a kid who's suffering from one of these things that we're going to be discussing today, um, you really need to develop a deeper bond, a friendship with your children. Because like we mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, I kind of skipped over it. One of the reasons why Adam and Hawa, they ate from the, from the tree, right, was because of the peer pressure that was put on them by shaitan. So your kids are going to be facing a lot of peer pressure in this society, everywhere they go, on their phones, in school, everywhere. So if you're not part of the peer pressure sphere, as I call it, then you're not going to have any effect on them once they, once they get older, right, and they become adults. And just a quick story to like kind of emphasize the, the effect of peer pressure. I actually used to work with a kid who was, mashallah, one of like the brightest kids that I've seen, like really bright, uh, came from an amazing family, hafiz of the Quran, and he worked in my pharmacy. And he was in pharmacy school. And so one day we're working, and one of my coworkers notices that he's trying to steal controlled medication. So he's trying to pocket Xanax and steal it. A kid who's like, everyone's thinking, mashallah, amazing kid. And to this day, I still believe he's an amazing kid. And, uh, and of course, like he got caught and he was fired. And so I had an opportunity to see the kid again and, and like just try and figure out what was it, like what was it. And then one day, subhanAllah, I was working out in the gym. I finished with my workout, I go down. And I'm sitting at a restaurant right across the street from the gym. I'm hanging out, just by myself, sitting in a corner, nobody could see me. And then all of a sudden, two kids walk into the restaurant that I'm sitting at. And they're like two younger kids. They look, uh, they look Muslim from some, some sort of faith. I don't want to throw anyone under, under the bus. And they walk up to the bar that's in the restaurant, and they try to order drinks. So I'm like, OK, maybe they're, maybe they're not Muslim, right? And then. They're trying to negotiate with the bartender, trying to, trying to get 
drinks out of him, and then another two kids come. And they're just hanging out with them, they're their friends, and they're still talking to the guy. And then all of a sudden, another two kids come, one of them who was the kid that I used to work with who got fired for trying to steal the drugs. And subhanAllah, he talked them out of trying to get alcohol from the bar, but then it made sense to me, like, oh, this is his environment, these are the relationships that he has, like, these are his friends. So it made sense to me why he did what he did. So no matter, even if you're a good kid, even if your kids are good kids, the people who they surround themselves with are going to be probably the biggest influence on them growing up. So make yourself part of that. Be a parent and a friend to your kids, inshallah. And just a quick psychology tip, if you, like I know some of us have difficulty talking with our children. Uh, the best, one of the best ways, tricks that you can use is to actually like talk about yourself to your kid. So instead of, like when your kid comes home, you want to know how their day was. Instead of saying, how was your day? They're just going to be like, oh, it's cool, whatever. They're not going to really tell you much. Tell them about your day. Tell them what happened with you. They'll reciprocate, guaranteed, and it's worked. I, 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 when I read about this, I tested it out with my sister. She came home from school one day. I was like, oh, you know, my, like, I had this type of patient today, and oh my God, I wanted to kill them. And she was like, yeah, oh my God, my friend, she did this, and I wanted to kill her. And blah. So if you share a story with them, they're going to share a story with you. But if you just ask them nonchalantly, how was your day? This would be like, good, whatever. They're going to go to their rooms and talk to their friends on the phone. Anyways, introduction. Music. There is not a person sitting in here who is more addicted to music than I was. Guaranteed. Like, I was just with Sheikh Shanawi in the airport. We were delayed for three hours, and there was like a restaurant right next to us playing like old songs. And I, wallahi, for three hours, there was maybe one song that I didn't know that came on the radio. And then when we landed, right, Nashville is like the city of music, there was a guy playing the guitar, and Sheikh Shanawi goes into the bathroom, he played three songs, I knew every single song. That's just how I grew up. I grew up, my environment, my relationships, everything was surrounded by music, right? So when I was first growing up, my older cousins, they were kind of my sphere of influence, my peers. Uh, they got into comic books, I got into comic books. They got into basketball cards collecting, I got into that. They got into hip hop and R&B, that's what I got into, right? And then my mom was a convert, so she wasn't, like she was someone who was just understanding, learning the religion herself. So she wasn't about to tell me like, oh, stop doing that, that's haram, right? She was just letting me live. And then on top of that, my dad was actually in the music business, and so, he would get CDs, early releases, before they would even come out, get me like boxes of CDs, and I would take them to school, and that's how I became popular. I was giving out CDs before they even came out in stores to my friends. So I was the cool kid because of music. And then one day, I guess this is when it started to kind of marinate that music might not be a good thing, like, but like subconsciously, uh, my dad got arrested, so he gets arrested because of like the music industry thing that he's in. And my mom's like, listen, like when he finally got out of jail, he's like, my mom's like, that's it, you have to leave. You can't, I don't want, music is haram, I don't want you dealing with it. And so my dad obliged, like he found uh, different work. And that's when I kind of started like feeling that, okay, maybe me listening to music might be not a good thing. But, like I said, I was way too, like, I was way too deep in it. Like, I couldn't just give it up, right? Then, on top of that, turn 17, I get my own car. I take all the money that I've saved up, $3,000 almost, and I put it into a stereo system in my car. And I used to be that guy driving around at 3 a.m. with my car blasted so loud that all the other car alarms in the neighborhood would go off. Like straight, that's how powerful the system that I had was. And then one day, I'm dropping my cousin off at, at a restaurant, double park, uh, with my music blasting, because everywhere I went, my music was blasting. And a cop knocks on my window, 
and he's like, roll it down. I'm like, what I do, officer? He's like, I'm three cars behind you and your car is shaking my car. Give me your license and registration. So I give him my license and registration. I don't have my registration, actually. My car windows are tinted. And he gives me three tickets, one for noise pollution, one for tinted, illegally tinted windows, and one for uh, not having my registration. So that was like a couple hundred dollars in tickets, it turned out. Um, like a wasted day for me, points on my license, my, my license eventually, uh, eventually got suspended. And then one day with this car that I used to love driving around and just like flaunting the, the stereo system that I had, I'm driving, I'm like a block away from my house, stopped at a red light, light turns green, I go, another guy tries to eat the red light and drives his car straight into my car. Straight into me. And subhanAllah, nothing happened to me. Like I saw the car coming at me, it hit me directly, and I, I thought I was gonna die, like in that slow motion, like you're thinking you're gonna die. And then I'm like, oh snap, I'm alive, I didn't die. Maybe I should start becoming a better Muslim, right? But I was still too deep into the music. I, can't, I couldn't give it up. Uh, and even one of my uncles, like the Haram police uncle, right, who comes over and he tries to like knock some sense into you, he came over. He was like, you know, why don't you leave this music? You know, there's no, like, Allah and the angels are not going to protect you while you're driving around blasting this music listen to Qur'an instead, and I'm just kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. Then, subhanAllah, two months passed by, my car was just on the verge of being completely totaled, but it wasn't, so they, they saw that it was cheaper for them to fix it. They fix it, they fix the system, I'm driving around, I got it back that same week, like two months later, a week, a week into having it, I take the car out on a weekend, driving around, I'm driving in Manhattan, New York City, driving down Park Avenue, music blasting again, and I get to the intersection of 37th and Park, green light, the car eats the red light, drives straight into me again for the second time. Second time I see my life flash before my eyes. Second time I walk away from the accident, nothing happens. And so then is when I was convinced that music is something that I need to stop listening to. And that was in 2005. So how many people here listen to music? That's it? Only all these, these kids in the front? How many people here know that it's wrong? So more people, know, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> how many people are convinced it's wrong? If you were convinced, you would not be listening to it. That's what I mean by if you're convinced, you're wrong. It's wrong. So we got a couple of people. So many people not convinced. Inshallah, the goal for this presentation right now, inshallah, I'm just going to present the facts to you with reason and religion. I'm going to give you the two, two sides as to why music is something that you might want to stay away from. And then you decide for yourself what you're going to do, right? I have a 15-year-old sister. She listens to music. I tell her all the time. She knows it's haram. She knows that she should not be listening to it, but she still does it anyways. So I'm not, I'm not going to convert anyone here today, inshallah maybe, but I'm going to give you the facts that maybe inshallah by you seeing these facts, you'll come to the realization that this is something maybe that I want to uh, make, put in the effort to stay away from. And so a man, just real quickly, a man came to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and he asked, he asked him, Ya Ibn Abbas, Ara'ayt al-ghina halalun huwa am haram? So he asked him, have you, have you heard of music? Is it, is it halal or is it haram? And so Ibn Abbas responds, Ara'ayt al-haq, Ara'ayt al-haq wa al-baatil, idha jaa yawm al-qiyamati, fa'ayna yakun al-ghina? So if you see truth and falsehood, on the day of judgment, where do you think music will be placed? on the side of truth or on the side of falsehood. And so the man, he answered probably how most of you would answer. He said, يَكُونُ مَعَ الْبَاطِلِ It's going to be with falsehood, right? And so Ibn Abbas said, اِذْهَبْ فَقَدْ أَفْتَيْتَ نَفْسَكَ Like, just go there, you answered your own question basically. And that's what I want you guys to do today. 
answer that question for yourself, inshallah. And so like I said, the two approaches that I'm going to take, reason and religion. And we're going to start with reason. And so there's a small disadvantage when we look at it from the side, side of reason and science and psychology because music is actually a good thing in, our, in the environment that we live. So no one's going to be really doing studies on the negative effects of music, but they do exist. Um, and so in all the research that I was able to, to kind of pull out, uh, researchers say that music is harmful in many ways, but there's three main ways in which music is harmful. And the first way, they say, is the kind of music that you listen to. That's the first way in which music can be harmful. Plato, and this, is a, this has been long debated and discussed throughout history. Plato, ancient Greek Plato, yes, he said that the kind of music that you listen to determines the balance of your soul. And Socrates actually said that if you listen to bad music, then that effect on your soul will be bad and you'll be a bad person. But if you listen to good music, they believe that there was good music, then that would have a positive effect on your soul and you would be a good person. And so, we could see that, walk into any high school, right? You'll see that the hip hop kids look like hip hop kids. The rock kids look like rock. The emo kids look like emo kids, right? Everyone looks like the music that they listen to. And so for me, I was into hip hop, I was into rap, and so all of my friends were into that, right? And I used to find myself in high school, in parties, surrounded by drugs, surrounded by alcohol. Alhamdulillah, I never did any of that stuff because I wasn't into it. But that was the environment that I was in because of the music that I liked, right? And so Howard Hansen, Howard Hansen is a man who died in the, in the 70s, but he was the director of the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. And that's like one of the most famous institutes for music in America. And this is a man in the 70s. He died in the 70s, he lived before that. But he said this, now imagine, this is a white, he's not Mufti Hansen, he's not Sheikh Hansen, he's a white man who listens to music, and this was his, his take on music, and I'm just gonna read you the quote. He said, I hesitate to think what the effect of music upon the next generation will be if the present school of hot jazz, that was the up and coming music during his era that he was talking about. He wasn't talking about the music of today, he was talking about hot jazz coming up in his time. He said, I hesit, uh, if, if, the, if the present school of hot jazz continues to develop unabated, much, much of it is crass, raucous, and commonplace, and could be dismissed without comment if it were not for the radio whereby hour after hour, night after night, American homes are flooded with vast quantities of this material. He's talking about the radio. They only had the radio to listen to music back then. Now you got music everywhere you go. The radio is your phone. So he's talking about the negative effects of the radio with regards to hot jazz. Then he says, perhaps, perhaps these kids who are listening to hot jazz, perhaps they're immune to its effect, but if they aren't, and mass production of this drug, he calls it a drug, isn't reduced, we may find ourselves a nation of neurotics, which even the skill of the psychiatrist may be hard pressed to cure. Even the psychiatrist is not gonna be able to cure the effects of hot jazz music playing on the radio in American homes. Now what would he say about the iPhone playing 24 seven, the kind of music that's playing today? And we'll get into the kind of music that plays today, right? Uh, there was also a study that I was able to found that was done in 2005 that compared degrading versus non-degrading sexual lyrics in music. And this was in 2005, they took the top 300 songs and they wanted to see which songs had degrading and non-degrading uh, um, lyrics with regards to sex. And they found that 120 of the songs had uh, degrading or non-degrading sexual references. That's 120. And so, I was thinking to myself, okay, that was done in 2005. Uh, let me look at the music of today. So I did my own study, right? I looked at the top 20 songs of today. Like I wasn't gonna go through 300. I looked at the top 20 songs and I said, okay, let me look at which song, how many of these songs will reference uh, 
either sexually implicit or explicit lyrics, as well as uh, drugs and alcohol and, and whatnot. And out of the 20, there were only two songs that didn't have any references to, to sex, drug, and drugs, right? And, th and those two songs, one of them, the artist, his name is Triple X Temptation, and he was rapping about suicide or singing about suicide because his girl left him. Uh, and the other guy, his name is NF, and mashallah, he's a Christian gospel rapper, so that's why uh, maybe he wasn't talking about sex in his song. And then I just, I just perused, like just look through the chart, and you look at the names of the singers themselves, you don't even need to look at their lyrics, their names. One guy, his name is 69, like really, he has like five songs, 69. He's like, yeah, see, all the kids know him, and they, they know the reference. Right? And he has like five songs. He looks like a shaitan. Like if you, like, like you just look at this guy, it's, it's scary. Wallahi, it's scary. I want to ask him what happened. Like, I really do. Um, another, another guy, Triple X Tentation. Another, another guy named Lil... What? No, no, I don't know who that is. That's down here. That's not in New York. Okay? But subhanAllah, just from the names of these singers, you can see the effects that music has and the kind of music that you listen to ha will have on you. The second um, sort of harmful effect that researchers single out is the amount of music that you listen to. So first they, 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 they look at the kind, then they look at the amount. And as of today, the average American listens to 35 hours of music a week. No, no, no. We're just getting started. Uh, so, so the average American listens to 35 hours of music a week. That's five hours of music a day. And you say, and you like say that to people who don't listen. They're like, that's impossible. But with the cell phone, you could you could manage that, right? In school, you can listen to music. In the bathroom, you can listen to music. While you're studying, you can listen to music. While you're eating, you can listen to music. Everywhere you go, your radio is attached to you. Um, and, there, and there's a man, who knows who Anton Levy is? Anton Levy, anybody here? Really? Anton Levy? No, so he's the founder of the Church of Satan. Right? And he died in the 90s. And he said, he said with regards to the TV, he said that the gospel of my church, of the Church of Satan, will just spread naturally with the fact that every house has a TV. Now every person has a TV with their cell phone. Like imagine what, like he's like, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to give da'wah. The TV will, will do my da'wah for me, right? And then we know, like, we know the amount is harmful. And another scientist, he, he, he says that the amount of music that you listen to is harmful because uh, his name is Alan Bloom. He was a professor in the University of Chicago. And he said, because constant exposure to music would lead to drug-like effects on your brain. And the greater uh, amount of music that you listen to, the greater the psychophysiological effects will be on you. So, and that's the third point, the third harmful effect, uh, the psychophysiological effect that it has on you. And what does that mean? It means the mind sort of body effect that music has on you. Because when you listen to music, it's going to affect your mind and, and therefore affect your, your actions. And a psychologist by the name of John, John Kappas, he said that when you combine the kind and the amount of music and you put it together, it causes basically sensory overload on you. Like that's the, that's the goal of music, to, to increase or decrease, put you in a heightened state or a lower state of emotion. And it basically turns your brain off. Once your brain is turned off, you're done thinking, any lyrics that go in, go straight into your brain because you're not thinking anymore. So subconsciously, you're just taking it all in, taking it all in, and then your mind and your body are going to act out what's already in, what's in your mind. And so, and you just, you could see it automatically in a, in a rock concert, right? The second the music starts playing, what do they do in a rock concert? Mosh pit. They start punching each other, going crazy, like, like any, any one of us will, we'd go in there, we wouldn't come out alive, right? And so, in the study that I mentioned, uh, in the beginning with the kind of music, the degrading versus 
non-degrading sex in pop culture, they, did, they took that, those results and they wanted to test it on kids. So they, they took 2,000 kids and they gave them a survey year one, year two, year three, teenagers. And they wanted to see the correlation between the kind of music that they listened to and the kind of sexual behavior that those kids would end up acting out. And they found indeed a, a very high correlation between the kids who listened to degrading sexual lyrics acted out more sexually than the kids who didn't listen to it. So it has an effect, and that's not, that's not questioned, right? And so, again, Alan Bloom, the, the, the professor from the University of Chicago, he said, music of today, and he's speaking about the 80s, right? Rock music in the 70s and 80s, not today's music. He's saying music of today has one appeal, and that appeal is to sexual desires. The lyrics, pay attention to this, he says the lyrics have a greater effect on children, on teenagers, than watching pornography. Why does he say that? He says because teenagers think that watching pornography is for old people. Old people are, the, are, are, are pervs, basically. They're the ones who are going to watch it. We're teenagers. We can actually act that out. We don't have to watch it. We can do it, right? And, and you see it in the lives of the musicians, right? They all act this out. None of them have every, if you follow the, the trending news about this star, that star, it's always a divorce. It's always this guy cheating on his girl, that musician cheated. Gene Simmons, who knows who Gene Simmons is? Gene Simmons is the lead sing, was the lead singer for a, a rock band called Kiss, right? This guy, he, he boasted that he never did drugs. He never did drugs, but he says, he slept with over 5,000 women throughout his, his career. 5,000. And his girlfriend, his girlfriend was his girlfriend for 30 years. When he finally married her, they had a bonfire because he had a picture of every single woman he slept with, and they burned them all together after he married his wife. This is the effects of music. One in three Americans today, one in three Americans walking around today, have an STD. One in four Americans have an incurable STD. But music's not a problem, right? And just look at the effects of music on the mind. And we, we, like, if music was a good thing, you would see it in the best musicians. But look at these people, Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson. All died from drug overdoses. All considered some of the best musicians of all time, right? And some more, Britney Spears, Demi Lovato, Eminem, Lady Gaga, all of them, all of them uh, suffer from substance abuse, some sort, sort of substance abuse. And they're the most successful musicians in their category around today. So just to summarize, the kind, the amount, and the psychophysiological effects of music. These are the three main things that people look at um, with regards to harm to music. What does the what does the religion now say? So we dealt with reason. What is what does our religion of Islam say about music? In the Quran, in Surah Al Najm, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "أَفَمِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ تَعْجَبُونَ وَتَضْحَكُونَ وَلَا وَلَا تَبْكُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَاعْبُدُوهُ." Right? He says, "Then of this, do you wonder? Of this recitation, do you wonder? And then you laugh and you don't weep, and what?" All this while you're engaged in vain play, Samidun, is, is translated as vain play. But the scholars said that this vain play was singing and dancing. And so Allah is reprimanding those who are Samidun, basically, in the Qur'an. And so the Qur'an will, does have an effect on your mind and body. But like I said in the first lecture, remember, you can't just listen to it passively like music and it's going to have its effect. You have to actually pay attention to it and reflect on it, right? Another, another ayah in the Qur'an that, that kind of lends credence to why music is, is prohibited. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْتَرِي لَهْوَ الْحَدِيثَ لِيُضِلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ وَيَتَّخِذَهَا هُزْوَا أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُهِينٌ And he says, of mankind is he who purchases lahwa al-hadith to mislead from the path of Allah. Lahwa al-hadith, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar and Ibn Mas'ud, they all translated lahwa al-hadith as music, right? And then the nail in the coffin 
for us as Muslims is the hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he basically says لَيَكُونَنَّ مِنْ أُمَّةِ أَقْوَامٌ يَسْتَحِلُّونَ الْحِرَى وَالْحَرِيرَ وَالْخَمْرَ وَالْمَعَازِفَ right? He says there will come a group of people from my ummah who will make halal, meaning that it was haram, who will make halal uh, illegal sexual intercourse, silk, uh, alcohol, and music. And, what, and what's the saying, right? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? Sex, drugs, and music, basically. All those three things that the Prophet ﷺ combined together, they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand with our society. So real quickly, uh, just so I can end on a, on a good, so a motivational point for you guys all to take home with you and inshallah act upon. Uh, for me, when I quit music, I quit in 2005. I didn't stop listening to music until maybe 2014, 2015, right? But I told myself in 2005, that's when I'm going to quit. Uh, and so when I noticed that, I couldn't do it just cold turkey. What I did was I set goals every single Ramadan. My, my main goal was to quit listening to music. But then I realized it was, it was better. And Allah is the one, he loves, uh, he loves consistent deeds even if they're small, right? So I told myself, okay, every year I'm going to take one thing with regards to music and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it out of my life. So one year I told myself, I'm not going to watch music on TV. I'm going to just listen to it on my computer or whatever. Now another year I told myself, I'm not going to share any music on social media. Like if I'm listening to the haram, I don't want to share the haram with anyone else. Then another year I told myself, um, no music in the car. No buying any, any new CDs. Until alhamdulillah, when, when you do this, when you show Allah, when you make the effort, Allah will make it easier for you until one day you'll notice, oh God, I, um, I don't have any desire to listen to this stuff anymore. And it's true, like I was so surprised when I looked at the, the top 100, I didn't know a single soul, maybe Drake, and that's about it, right? But I don't, I don't live, he's just very, he's that, that popular, right? And then people uh, who recover from addictions, they usually find something to replace that addiction with. And so Ramadan is coming up. Make your intention to get rid of the music, your main intention. Pick one small thing that you can do to actually see that through. And then tell yourself, okay, I'm gonna replace the music with the best thing that there is, and that's the Quran, right? And of course, don't go ham, don't go crazy. Like, pick small steps. So maybe one year, you're gonna start to learn how to read the Quran if you don't know how to read it. Then another year, you're going you're gonna to tell yourself, okay, I'm going to learn Tajweed. Then another year, I'm going to read Quran one page daily. And I'm going to do that in Ramadan and take that all the way. Like scientists, they say, like scientists are divided into two groups. Some say 21, 21 days in order to develop a habit. Some say 40 days to develop a habit. I say Ramadan is perfect. 30 days, you can develop a habit in that time, right? Get rid of an addiction and develop a habit. The, ha the addiction, inshallah, is going to be to get rid of music. And the habit, inshallah, will be to instill and replace the music with the Qur'an. And may Allah make us from all those who listen to what is said and follow the best of it. I mean, questions? Uh, do I have to give questions? Okay, real quick, what...